This is NASA TV. Good morning, everybody. I'm NASA's Dan Hewitt. Welcome from NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston as we are going to spend the next hour talking to the returning astronauts of NASA's SpaceX Crew 4 mission. Here in the room with me, I have Bob Hines, Jessica Watkins, and Chell Lindgren. And then joining us from Europe, we have Samantha Crisforetti. It's been just under a week since they returned home with a splashdown back on October 14th after spending 170 days in space. So they're gonna answer some of your questions today. We'll have media on the phone bridge, and then if you're following along on social media, you can use the hashtag AskNASA to submit your question. Before we kick things off, I'm going to hand it over to the Crew 4 Commander, Chell Lindgren, for some quick opening remarks, Chell. Uh, thanks, Dan. Well, it's, uh, we, we are delighted to be here. Um, it's great to be back on Earth. We had an extraordinary experience on the International Space Station, uh, initially working with uh, Crew 3, and then with our ex uh, Expedition 67 colleagues, and then getting to see um, our Expedition 68 colleagues, Soyuz colleagues, and then uh, Crew 5. And, and having that opportunity to all work together, um, getting to spend months on the space station conducting science and research to extend our presence in the solar system and improve life back here on Earth. And, uh, and what an amazing um, experience from beginning to end, launching on the, the Crew Dragon rocket uh, on the Falcon and then coming home and landing in the Atlantic. Uh, so uh, we, are, we are so grateful to all of the teams that, uh, that were involved, um, our training team, our uh, operations team, folks sitting on flight console, and uh, people, our, our, our teammates all over the world in uh, mission control centers uh, uh, with our international partners, and of course our uh, SpaceX partners who got us to the space station, supported us while we were on orbit, and, uh, and got us home safely. So, uh, and, and all, obviously a huge thanks to our, our families as well, friends and families that provided support uh, throughout the, the training cycle and uh, supported us while we were on orbit. Um, we are really excited to, to be here back on Earth and excited to answer your questions. All right, thank you so much, Chell. So we're gonna jump right into it. If you're on our phone bridge, remember, press star one to get into the question queue, and please address your question to a specific astronaut, as again, we have Samantha joining us from Europe, so we wanna try and make that a little bit easier. So we will start off first in our queue is Gina Sinceri with ABC News. Gina. Out of all the science you did up there, was one that went, boy, this is the one that's going to get us to live on the moon or get us to Mars. You know, what stood out for you for long-term exploration? Um, yeah, so, you know, I think that was one of the, the really neat parts about being um, a part of the ISS crew was getting to use the International Space Station as a test bed and as a means of, of testing different technologies and um, operational schemes in order to prepare us to go further into the solar system, to the moon and eventually to Mars. Um, one experiment um, that comes to mind, one study that we worked on um, was called AstroRAD. So one of the, the um, biggest challenges challenges ahead of us in terms of, of going deeper into the solar system is the, the issue of radiation and how we shield and protect our astronauts um, from that, that radiation threat. And so working on the, the AstroRad um, um, experiment technology test, um, we, it is a um, vest that the, the crew members can wear um, during a, a solar event, and enable, it enables the crew member to still continue working, still be productive, but be protected during that time frame. And the neat thing about the, the Astrad vest that, um, that we tried on while we were on orbit is that it will also be on the mannequin um, that will go up on Artemis 1 here shortly, um, launching next, next month. Um, so to have that, that parallel between that experience on orbit, and then um, we'll be able to see that, that vest in the actual environment um, headed to the moon and be able to put those pieces together to, to start building a picture and, and moving forward um, with that technology is really exciting. All right. Thank you, Jessica. Next up, we have Elizabeth Howell with Space.com. Liz. 
Hello, everybody. Welcome home. This is for Samantha. Um, can you bring us a bit behind the scenes for your planning for all the costumes that you were bringing up, such as the 2001 costume? Uh, yes, uh, sure thing. Um, you know, I, I'm not a big movie watcher, as my crewmates know very well. In fact, I, I have this uh, running joke, but it's maybe not really a joke, is that I've, I've only watched like 15 movies in my life. Um, but uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey is one that I have actually watched multiple times and uh, that I um, really enjoy and uh, appreciate um, deeply as a work of art and uh, something that has really um, influenced uh, our imagination, our visual imagination right, when it comes to space and uh, you know, it's 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 decades old now, and yet it doesn't feel old. It feels still very very current and uh, and valuable. And so, you know, when when we plan a mission to space, I, at least for me, it's always important to um, you know, of course, the number one priority is to do your job correctly. To, you know, to to train and and perform correctly as a crew member. Um, but I, I always uh, think a little bit about oh, what can I bring that bridges the you know that, that creates a bridge to the um, broader culture. And so I always had this idea of doing something to celebrate 2001: a Space Odyssey. And um, also, I was generally curious about whether Velcro shoes would work or not. And so I, I had this, this thing in the back of my mind. Um, I had it for a long time. And then it so happened that a few months before launch, I was in, uh, in Los Angeles, where we uh, did part of our training at the uh, SpaceX facilities out there. And um, I, um, I had a little bit of free time. And I just started <laughs> wandering through um, used, uh, um, uh, like, you know, secondhand fashion shops to see if I could find something that uh, would uh, work as a costume uh, to play that flight attendant. Um, and very last minute, I, I happened to find that, um, that you know, pant dress, um, something that I would, you know, it's, it's not something that I would buy for myself uh, normally, but um, it, it seemed to fit perfectly for, for that need. Um, actually, the, um, the person at SpaceX who is uh, um, responsible for uh, making the suits. Um, she uh, was uh, very helpful uh, last minute. Uh, she did me the favor of uh, making stirrups and, uh, and a couple of uh, modifications that were needed. And I was able to turn it in last minute so that it could be uploaded. Um, and then when I was in space, I think it was uh, Sergei, one of my um, Russian uh, crewmates who uh, had the idea of the location because it was also not obvious um, to find a suitable place on space station, you obviously needed a uh, circular hatch, which is only available in the Russian segment. And then, you know, what, what do you do with the Velcro? But it so happens that there is this module in the Russian segment that worked just perfectly because it has the, um, I guess, the female Velcro all around the, the walls. Um, and so I, uh, I gave it a try. Uh, it took uh, a few uh, attempts, uh, but uh, eventually it worked out. And uh, and then, of course, our video editor uh, and Isa did a stellar job of, of putting the, the video material together. And I was just thrilled. All right. Our next question comes from Marvin Marshall with the Nighttime News Space Report. Marvin. Hi, my name is Marvin Marshall from the Nighttime News Space Report on Twitch.tv. Welcome back to Earth, everyone. Um, I hope you all have been having a great day today. It's great to be able to talk to you guys again, but not moving at, you know, 27,500 kilometers an hour this time. Uh, now, this question is for uh, is from one of my viewers here uh, named Du. Um, now, for Jell or and anyone else who wants to chime in, uh, what diodes on X-Roots uh, did you guys use? And what spectrum of light, uh, if you guys know that? Uh, you know, we saw some pictures of the roots, and they, they looked so healthy. Uh, and thank you again. Welcome home, everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, what a, an amazing opportunity to work on the, the veggie enclosure, to work on the X-Roots project. Um, I had the opportunity during my last mission to work on veggie, and we grew plants in a soil matrix, basically soil contained within little pillows. And uh, this project, X-Roots, is looking at advan an advanced technology, at least for the space station, of using hydroponics and aeroponics. Uh, this is a, a technology that is scalable, um, 
to the, the sizes and requirements that we were gonna need for a long duration space flight. And so it was really interesting to watch uh, these plants grow to get to tend. I think we all had the opportunity to work on them and to, to tend to them, um, peek in on them on a daily basis and really work with them a couple of times a week uh, was really a refreshing experience, literally, because when you would pull down the uh, kind of the um, accordion enclosure around it, you could just smell earth. You could smell the plants. Um, it was absolutely amazing. We got to grow peas and tomatoes and um, onions and uh, and so to, sm to smell those smells wa was absolutely amazing. To see something living, growing uh, there in the space station uh, was really an extraordinary experience. I don't know the wavelength of light. It was pink, very pink. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely knew when the light was on because it, the, the whole Columbus module would glow in pink. Um, but I think that we all really appreciated the opportunity to work with those plants. Okay, our next one comes from Allie Heath, or Health, whatever your last name is, I apologize, from my Denver. Allie. Hi, um, our question is for Jessica Watkins. Um, we would love to know what was the hardest thing to adjust to on the space station, and what's the hardest thing to adjust to now that you're back on Earth? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question, and, and the answer might actually be the same um, for both um, going up to the space station and coming home. Um, and I think that is just the first few days of kind of adaptation where your brain is, is trying to figure out what's going on. Um, going up to the station, we... Um, it, it, most of the station felt very familiar. So we have an excellent team of instructors um, who prepare us diligently um, to, to go up to the space station. And when we get up there, um, we are familiar with the hardware. We, we understand you know, how to execute the tasks that need to be performed. Um, but in, in juxtaposition to that familiarity is also this unfamiliarity of the you know, kind of most unfamiliar environment you could find yourself in, in, in microgravity. And so trying to kind of marry those two things up and kind of watch your brain um, pretty quickly adapt to working in three dimensions. Um, and your, your body is adapting to that as well in that process. And so kind of um, seeing that, that happen really kind of, it's almost an out-of-body experience where you can kind of see your brain starting to be able to take corners a little bit better and um, start to understand that there is really no up or down. Um, it was really kind of a neat experience. And then on the way the way back, um, we had a very similar experience where your brain is, is again, trying to remap to actual gravity, to 1G here on Earth. Um, and we are still kind of in the process of, of that um, at the moment, but every day um, you see these kind of huge leaps where where your, your brain and your body are, are readjusting to life back here on Earth. Okay, next up we have Marsha Smith with Space Policy Online. Marsha? Uh, thanks so much for asking my question. I'd like to ask each of the astronauts what advice they would give to the companies that are building the commercial LEO space stations. You know, what should they be taking into account in their design, either or, or both in terms of livability aboard those space stations and also in terms of making the most efficient use of stations for scientific and technical research. If they had one piece of advice to give to each of the companies, what would they suggest? Well, I think that's a, that is a great question, and I think that that is, uh, that is really what we need to be looking at uh, as we move forward. You know, we're, we're trying to take these next leaps uh, into, into deep space exploration, and I think we need to really start thinking out of the box uh, on a lot of these things. Uh, but first and foremost, if we're going to do human exploration, you've got to put the human in the equation, right? And so I think uh, new and efficient ways for how we design our habitats, uh, de you know, designated habitat modules, uh, as well as, you know, just improvements and next generation technologies for uh, the, you know, the things that we've pioneered here on Space Station. Uh, but Space Station, you know, is a 20-year-old platform right now. And so those things that we have on there uh, have certainly laid the groundwork, but, you know, that's where we pivot to commercial industry uh, to take that next step of innovation and figure out how we can do this better and more efficiently and more sustainably uh, as we move into uh, the deep space exploration. Because some of the things that we have right now, certainly we've built that technology, uh, but we are still very Earth dependent on a lot of these things where we need supplies and continuous uh, um, will supply from, from Earth. And so we're going to need that kind of innovation and independent thought uh, moving forward. 
uh, in order to uh, really get uh, enable this exploration so that we can be Earth independent and have all of these uh, um, you know, human life sustaining uh, technologies on board. Yeah, absolutely. I certainly um, agree with Bob here um, that, that that is going to need to be the focus moving forward. Um, I think I would just add from a scientific perspective, um, certainly one of the, the places that we enjoyed the most on the ISS is the cupola. Um, being able to look out the window, see the earth below us, make scientific observations as well, um, both from the cupola and the, the wharf um, window as well. And so having um, more of those, those places, more windows, more opportunities for crew members to um, interact with the environment that um, that they are in, whether that is um, a view of the Earth or a view of the Moon or, or even further on to Mars. Um, that um, ability to make those scientific observations, I think, is, is really important moving forward. That's good. And I wanted to see, Sam, is there anything you wanted to add on what you would like to see in a future space station? Um, I don't know that I have one specific thing, but I I think that, um, and, and this will probably happen naturally, that um, there is going to be a transition from an environment that is, um, first and foremost, the technological environment and the human, like the astronauts in our case, adapt to it. Uh, so I, I think that we fairly easily, I would say, but it's also our job, we, we find workarounds to to do with what is available in terms of uh, habitability. Um, but if we are going to transition to commercial space stations and and have space flyers who uh, who maybe don't you know don't fly to space as a profession, but maybe fly to space also for their enjoyment, uh, then I think that there will probably have to be a little bit more of a meeting halfway, uh, where it's not only the human that adapts to the environment and the technology, but also a little bit that the environment is is built with with the human being in, in, in mind, which is, uh, I think, what uh, uh, Bob was uh, was saying uh, at the beginning. Probably reaching out to the design community is, uh, is I believe, a, a great idea. I think designers are very much used to bridge that gap between the, the, the function and, and the use, but but also the the usability and the pleasure of, of using an object or a, or a feature. Uh, so I'm, I'm I'm pretty sure that that will uh, that that will happen uh, naturally. Thank you. Okay, next up we have Mark Corot with Aviation News and Space. Mark. Thank you very much. Um, mine's for uh, Dr. Lindgren. How would you sort of accept? Um, a couple of days ago, the go go was given to resume uh, scheduled spacewalks, and so I'm just, um, you know, not trying to connect so much to that, but noting that as being important to the to the maintenance of the space station. And so I'm sort of wondering what your assessment of of its structural health at this point and its potential for science and technology development potential into the future. Yeah, thank you. It's a it's a great question. Of course, the ability to spacewalk to, to conduct spacewalks is integral um, to our ability to maintain uh, the space station. Um, it, it you know when you step back and look at it, it's a, it's amazing that this vehicle has been flying for over 20 years. That the very first elements were were launched over 20 years ago. And when I think about a a car here on the Earth that's 20 years old. Um, I mean, they're typically in pretty bad shape. And and the space station certainly. Uh, visually is showing its age, but um, we, we have an amazing team of engineers here on the ground, uh, both here at uh, Johnson Space Center and uh, centers all over the world that are looking at uh, the health of the vehicle, um, our ability to provide spares, our ability to, to do the maintenance, um, and to preserve its ability to, to serve as a platform for science and research. and. Uh, so understanding that, understanding the studies that have been done and, um, and the analyses that have been conducted, you know, I think that the, the space station is in really good shape and I know that we are uh, all excited as a community to see it continue to serve as a platform for exploration and for preparation for our mission to the moon and, uh, and ultimately to Mars. And so, um, you know, of course, there's an incredible amount of investment that has gone into the space station, not only uh, by the U.S. taxpayer, but by uh, communities all, and nations all over the world. And uh, we want to continue to see uh, a return on that investment and to utilize and leverage um, this platform as long as we can. And, but to do it in a, in a safe way 
And so I, I know that, uh, again, that we have teams that, that uh, continue to look at it and its viability into the future. And I think we're all very excited to see um, use into uh, the late 20s um, up into 2030. Okay, we're gonna jump over and take a couple of social media questions. Just a reminder though, for folks on the phone bridge, if you do have another question, press star one and we can get you back in the queue. Uh, this one I'm gonna send over to Bob, and this is from Swami. What were the first sensations after returning to Earth and taking a breath of fresh air? <laughs> Oh yeah, that is uh, one of those things that is uh, seared into my uh, my memory. So right after splashdown, I think we were all kind of surprised when we first splashed down uh, that it wasn't really as dynamic or provocative as we thought uh, in the capsule, um, you know, bobbing around in the ocean there. Uh, but once uh, SpaceX retrieved the capsule and we got hoisted up onto the uh, onto the deck, uh, and they uh, they you know wheel us up and they crack the hatch, uh, I just remember there's uh, just a very light. Uh, rush of air that came in and the smell of that saltwater air. And we were so blessed to uh, land on, I think, a 75 degree day in Florida with very low humidity. Uh, it was phenomenal. Uh, and so that first sensation was like, oh, it's so nice to be home, uh, you know, because we've been smelling the same air for, uh, for the last six months. So uh, getting a breath of fresh air out there over the ocean was absolutely spectacular. Um, and then, uh, you know, they pull us out onto, um, out of the capsule and we uh, you know, kind of get our feet down on the deck uh, as we transition over to the gurney. And that's where we noticed, uh, that was the first time I noticed anyway, that, oh yeah, the ship's rocking. <laughs> so uh, uh, certainly a little wobbly on our feet and you know, the teams do a great, uh, great job taking care of us there. But uh, that first breath of fresh air was uh, absolutely spectacular. Uh, on orbit, Chell alluded to it earlier, you know, we get the smells of um, some of the, uh, the <clears throat> excuse me, the plants out of the veggie compartment but we also had some fresh fruit sent up, and I just had, remember having a physical reaction to the first orange that I, uh, that I smelled, and I did not anticipate it or realize how much I missed that. And so, uh, you know, just all those nature uh, smells and, and, you know, all those senses were just absolutely phenomenal. So kind of unleashing, you know, the earth unleashing that on us when that hatch opened was, uh, was absolutely amazing. That's awesome. Thanks, Bob. Yeah. Okay, this one, I'm gonna go Chell and Samantha. How was this mission different from your other mission? Start with Chell. Sure, you know, it was, uh, it was an extraordinary mission. And just, just like the last one, it was so much fun to see the space station again, to, to be reintroduced to that weightless environment. Um, some things were new, but a lot had stayed the same. And uh, the space station, it's, it's kind of a visual assault initially because it is, so busy, so complex, there's so much stuff in there. So you're taking that in, you're taking in the smell of space, you're taking in the weightlessness, so that the physical component. And, uh, and so really a special experience to, to be reintroduced to the space station and then to quickly uh, re uh, acclimate to that environment. Um, the, the biggest difference and the, I think one of the greatest joys is the crew. And so this is, a, for me, it was a completely different crew than my last mission. And uh, so getting to be up there with, uh, with Farmer and Wadi uh, and watch them acclimate to the environment for the very first time, to be up there with Samantha and with our Russian colleagues um, was a lot of fun. And so different crew from my last one, but that's what makes, I think, these missions so, spe so special is the people that you're, that you're up, with, up there with and the team that you're working with on the ground. Sam. Your mic's muted. I was just saying that I, I feel very much the same about uh, the crew. That's what makes uh, every mission uh, absolutely unique. And, uh, you know, I think uh, I was blessed with uh, amazing uh, crewmates uh, throughout, both my uh, four crewmates who are present here and uh, all the people that we uh, cross paths with uh, on orbit. Um, as far as the differences, I, I think I had an immediate feeling that the station has become busier. There is more stuff. <laughs> you just have this immediate visual impact that there is more equipment. Every little um, available space is now uh, used. Um, I, I thought that space station was busy last time, but you know I, I hadn't seen anything yet. Um, 
Sometimes it's also a challenge. Uh, you know, the habitability is more challenging for sure. Um, and also, you know, the the, the daily uh, activities and deconflicting all the daily activities that uh, it, it's definitely challenging, but it's a good challenge to have, I think. I mean, we want space station to be used to the maximum of its uh, potential. Um, and, and so it, it was great, great to, to see that. Uh, and of course, now we have uh, uh, four uh, USOS uh, crew members. So the, you know, the non-Russian part of uh, space station um, has four crew members now, which means, you know, a whole extra work day every day you know, um, uh, of one person. So again, 25% more or 30% more, uh, depending how you want to see it, uh, more activities. So just a very, very busy. I, I think it gave me a sense of, of a more mature laboratory where, you know, things are going with a much faster pace and, and with a lot more um, diverse, advanced facilities available for science. All right, we'll do one more social question for right now. This one's from Julie, and I'll send this one to Wadi. Can we use any sustainable practices from the space station here on Earth? Yeah, you know, I think that's an excellent question, and, and the answer is a resounding yes. Um, after having spent six months six months up there and, and getting a real sense for um, all of the ways that the, the team on the ground and the, and the on-orbit um, part of the team is, is contributing to the sustainability um, of the station that can be applied to back here on Earth. Um, one, in, in kind of in general, I think um, the philosophy with which we um, maintain and um, and operate the International Space Station, I think, is, is an important one. Um, we have a, a kind of a philosophy where, in general, we spend about 30 percent of our time, um, of our, you know, kind of timelined crew um, time on orbit is spent doing maintenance of the station. And then about 70 percent of the time, the rest of the time is um, doing science and, and other operations. Um, but I think that if we took that type of philosophy, that type of mentality, and applied it to the Earth and our preservation and sustainability of the Earth, um, I think we would end up with, with different results and, have, and just have a different focus. So I think even just that overarching philosophy of operating the station um, has really important applications. Um, in terms of, of actual um, you know, more specific examples. Um, one is the water recycling that we um, are able to accomplish on orbit. So I think we are at about 95, 96% um, of our water that is we are able to reclaim and recycle um, and use the next day. Um, and so being able to take that moisture out of the atmosphere off of um, our, our bodies and, and then um, filter it and um, clean it and then be able to use it to drink and to use. Um, that type of technology, I think, um, has really important applications to um, uh, places on the earth where clean, fresh water is not as available. Um, and equally, um, when we think about um, food security, um, Chell mentioned X roots a bit earlier, um, but that type of technology, that hydroponics, aeroponics, um, in places where uh, soil, fertile soil is, is not as abundant and um, being able to come up with technologies, pursue technologies that um, enable food security in those areas um, and uh, help develop uh, greenhouses um, that, that would enable that. Um, those types of technologies that we're developing on the ISS um, have really important uh, applications to sustainability on Earth. Thank you. And keep sending in those questions using hashtag AskNASA. I will try and get to a few more in this, but these three are going to be sticking around after and answering some more for you on Twitter. We're going to jump back over the, to the phone bridge now for some follow-ups. We'll start off with Marvin Marshall. I almost call him Marvin the Martian every single time uh, with Nighttime News Space Report. Marvin. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Um, hi, again, Marvin Marshall here from the Nighttime News Space Report. Uh, now, this question is uh, for everybody. Um, it's from one of my viewers named uh, Cassie T. Uh, she wants to know, uh, you know, for all of you here, you know, how was there and what was your favorite meal uh, aboard the space station? Thank you again. Start us off, Bob. <laughs> Uh, that's a good question. So one of the, uh, you know, the food is uh, obviously a very important piece, not only just from general nutrition and that kind of thing, but also from a morale standpoint. And uh, we're, we're fortunate to have a very large variety uh, of food uh, and a, a menu that we can kind of customize uh, a little bit. And, you know, we even have uh, some allowances for some um, personal favorites that we're allowed to uh, have sent up uh, while, we're, uh, while we're up there. And so having that variety is, uh, is really helpful. Um, you know, one of the things, the little things that I really liked was just having uh, some hard candy to, uh, you know, to, uh, to suck on and have, uh, 
you know, just to kind of give some uh, that fresh fruit kind of uh, kind of flavor or something like that. But um, the variety was really really important. Um, I, I think I I was uh, I was kind of a lasagna guy for the most part. Uh, so we had that opportunity, and thankfully we had uh, Samantha along that uh, brought a, a plethora of uh, olive oil uh, along. So we had we had uh, all kinds of things to choose from there. Um, but uh, I, I would defer to uh, Chell and Wadi because uh, they were very innovative with uh, with what they did with the food, and uh, some of it was pretty spectacular, both visually and otherwise. <laughs> Um, yeah, one, one of my, my favorite um, things to do, well, first of all, um, putting anything in a tortilla made it um, at least 10% uh, more delicious. So we did a lot of that. Um, and one example of that was um, we had a, a burger patty um, available to us. And so we put the, the burger in the tortilla. And then um, I like to add a little bit of macaroni and cheese um, on top of the burger and just a, just a dab of barbecue sauce. Um, One burger! Exactly. <laughs> yeah, so it kind of became a thing. <laughs> um, so, so the Wadi Burger was always spectacular. Yeah. Uh, I became notorious for putting more food into a tortilla than was probably wise. Um, or, or possible. Or possible. <laughs> <laughs> Only possible in zero G. Right. Um, and so I'd like to put a meat and then some type of a side, generally rice. Uh, there were a couple of times. And so every time I would do it, these guys would just shake their heads because it didn't look like it was going to fit. Um, but I made it fit. And then one night, uh, Bob was witness to the triple decker where I put an, an extra side in there. And uh, he claims that I unhinged my jaw to be able to eat, eat that, but uh, we have it all video evidence. <laughs> <laughs> it all worked. My favorites uh, actually, um, muff, muff, muffin. I'm sorry, maple, maple muffin, muffin tops, which was a one of the breakfast foods and one of the few baked kind of baked items that we have. Um, that was a favorite from last time and persisted as a favorite this time. And then I really liked uh, oatmeal with brown sugar. Mm -hmm. uh, that was kind of a breakfast treat for me. Um, those were my favorites. And over to Sam. Uh, yeah, I, I, I was a little bit spoiled um, because I, I had actual food pouches that were made specifically for me based on my uh, requests and, uh, and taste. Uh, and so those were uh, my favorite, I would say. Uh, and probably two um, stood out. One was a, um, like a, you know, a main meal. It was a spelt salad with a uh, little tuni, asparagus, and uh, other vegetables. And uh, as uh, Bob mentioned, I had an ample supply of Italian olive oil. And so I, 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 you know, I used to put a lot of uh, olive oil on it. Uh, and then the other was more like uh, either breakfast or a dessert. It was like a, a yogurt pudding, um, freeze dried, and uh, it was chocolate flavored and it had a lot of uh, very uh, delicious fruit in it. Okay, next up on our phone bridge, Elizabeth Howell with space.com. Liz? Hello, I'd like to bring this back to Samantha, please. Um, can you talk about your busy few days as the first uh, European female commander of the space station, just what that was like and all of the activities that were going on? Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, I, I'd like to say that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very grateful and honored that I, I had that opportunity for a short time to um, serve as uh, commander of uh, the space station. Um, I, I would say, um, uh, practically speaking, it, it's not like it changed uh, a lot, uh, just because I, I had been uh, throughout the mission um, uh, responsible for the activities on the um, U.S. Uh, OS or the U.S. segment. Uh, and when I say responsible, of course, I mean from the point of view of the crew, we all know that uh, Space Station is actually run by the flight director on, on the ground, and we had a stellar uh, lead flight director. Um, so big shout out to her. Um, but of course, you know, when, when you do become commander, you, you kind of have in mind that a uh, bad day when, you know, something bad happens and there is an emergency on Space Station and maybe there might be a situation in which you are called upon to, um, you know, make decisions that affect the, uh, the safety of the crew. And so that, that's what was mostly on my mind on, on this uh, couple of weeks. Um, then, of course, fortunately, nothing like that happened. And uh, I think there were mostly two weeks devoted to um, handing over to the incoming crew. We had our uh, crewmate, Frank Rubio, the, um, uh, who had come up on, on Soyuz as part of uh, um, the first uh, crew swap with the commercial crew. And so we had an opportunity to have a, a pretty long handover with him of, uh, um, you know, two to maybe even three weeks. Um, and then uh, the last week we had our um, 
our uh, friends of True Five come up, including uh, the Russian cosmonaut Anna Kikina. So the, the very first cosmonaut to fly in a U.S. commercial vehicle, so that was exciting. And uh, and she's also a very good friend and, and a person that I uh, greatly ad admire and like. Um, and then, of course, uh, Koichi, um, Nicole, and uh, and Josh. And with them, of course, we had a pretty short handover of about a week, which is a good time. I mean, it, it's not too short, it's not too long, but uh, definitely uh, short enough that you have to make sure you make uh, a good use of, of the time you have with those guys to uh, set them up for uh, for success. Okay, next up we have Ali Heath, My News Denver. Ali? Hi, uh, two more questions. We were, oh, is this a little bit better? I think um, we were wondering how you guys keep your sanity on the space station given that it's such a confined space um, and you're with each other for so long. Ali, can you repeat that real quick? You got a little broken up. Yes, is this a little bit better? Yes, go ahead. Okay, uh, we were wondering how you guys were able to keep your sanity on the space station given it's such a confined space and you're with the same group of people for so long. Waddy burgers, right? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <clears throat> Yeah, so I think, uh, I mean, very integral to that, uh, you know, keeping our sanity uh, is the crew, right? Like we're all, uh, we all get along really well. We were really, uh, really fortunate to have such an amazing crew. Uh, so we always had lots of things to talk about. Uh, obviously, any long duration mission, uh, no matter what you're doing, you're going to have some frustrations. You're going to have road bumps along the way. Uh, so having a crew that is, uh, that you can vent to and then, you know, uh, that's also understanding of uh, our own little flaws and uh, idiosyncrasies and, and tolerant of those things is, uh, is really important. Uh, thank you all for that. Um, but, uh, you know, the other things, you know, Wadi talked about, you know, windows uh, being, uh, you know, scientifically um, pertinent and, you know, being able to do observations to that. But uh, having the opportunity to decompress and go to a spot like the cupola and look outside and just look at the wonderful beauty of our planet 100% uh, uh, helps you know, helps uh, with that. You, you can, um, it, it was just such a great place to go and recharge. And and I think some of the most special moments of our mission are when we are sitting down in the cupola looking at some spectacular site, whether it be the amazing aurora, uh, some cloud formations, some, um, you know, rocks uh, for our uh, geology friends out there. Uh, <laughs> You know, just some, just those opportunities to really spend time together uh, were really, really important. And uh, yes, it's a very busy place. We're doing amazing science and we're working hard every day. Uh, but those opportunities to just uh, recharge uh, and spend time together as a crew uh, just were really special and really help, uh, you know, keep that efficiency and that productivity uh, when, you know, when the work has to be done. And I'll, I'll just add to that, you know, I think that, it, kind of like my last mission, it was several months in when I kind of stopped and thought like, man, we have been cooped up in this same volume with these same people for three months, four months. And you, it's, it feels very natural. And you, you know, I never felt claustrophobic or confined. It just felt like, hey, this is a great group of folks. We've been working together in preparation. We've been working together up here for, for several months and it just, it just works. And we're all looking out for each other um, I think that it makes things run very smoothly, and uh, we, we were very efficient and got work done, but we could rely on each other uh, uh, for help and uh, for a shoulder to lean on. Um, yeah, it was spectacular and pretty amazing how yeah. long you go before you, you kind of recall, like, oh my goodness, I mean, we've been doing this for four months and, and really not thought about it, yeah. so, yeah. Yeah. Agree. There were, there were a lot of dad jokes, however. <laughs> put that out there. They were great. They were awesome. Uh -huh. uh, one thing I think that's integral to that, though, um, and, I, and this has applications elsewhere, right, is uh, I think we become very uh, deliberate about when we're doing something, thinking about how it affects others mm -hmm. first, right? And that is something that is super important. And that obviously has applications down here uh, on Earth and how we all get along um, and, and that kind of thing. So I find that, that to be really important, you know, is that when I'm doing something, I go, how does this affect Wadi's space? Am I getting into her space? Am I getting into her habits or anything like that? And is it going to affect her negatively? And if so, maybe I should talk to her about it first. Um, so I think that that's a really, uh, you know, important aspect of it. And, and it's something that we train to, and it is a very deliberate piece of our training uh, to look at those kinds of behaviors and those kind of considerations. Um, 
in order for us to be productive uh, over a long duration mission. That's great. I, I thought you were going to throw in a dad joke. It turned into a dad lesson. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Don't encourage him. There's a, a master class for dad jokes that uh, Chow and I are putting together. All right. Next up, we have Marsha Smith, Space Policy Online. Marsha. Uh, thanks so much. My question is for Samantha. I was wondering if you could talk about your spacewalk. Uh, how different was it than what you expected? Were there things that were easier or harder to do? And as one of the few non-Russians who's trained in the Russian EVA suit, are there any pointers that you would give to the two U.S. companies that are designing new U.S. suits? Yes, um, an interesting question. So uh, first of all, I, I feel very privileged that I have had the opportunity over the course of my uh, career as an astronaut to train in, uh, in both the NASA suit and the Russian suit. Um, I trained in a NASA suit for my uh, previous space flight, uh, so eight, ten years ago. Um, I did not have an opportunity to do so uh, this time, but I had an opportunity to train again for the second time in, in the Russian suit, and then I was thrilled that uh, this time I had an opportunity to actually um, put that all that training to, to work and uh, have that experience of uh, going out of the door. I would say the um, I would encourage anyone building or designing a new suit to uh, really take a good look at both those suits because it seems to me that both have pro and cons and uh, and and you know designing a suit that has the best of uh, the EMU and and the Orlan uh, you know it, it would be the the perfect suit um, and in terms of uh, of the experience, it was uh, uh, very challenging. Um, I would say, especially physically, uh, very demanding. It's a suit that works at a higher pressure on, on the on the higher end of of pressure compared to the um, EMU, which you know has a number of uh, of operational advantages, but also makes it um, you know harder to <laughs> to um, to operate. And you know, I'm I'm, I'm obviously a, a pretty small person, a small female. I'm not you know on the upper end of, of physical strength for obvious reasons, and and so that was definitely challenging. Um, mentally, though, I would say I, I felt quite at ease from from the beginning, and uh, you know, it, it's something I didn't I, I didn't know I didn't quite know what to expect. Uh, I've heard of people getting disoriented when they first go out the door. I have heard that usually they try to time the exit with the orbital eclipse with with night so that you get less disoriented. But we we did you know end up accumulating a little bit of delay in our uh, pre egress ops, and so we ended up um, getting out of the hatch. Uh, during daylight, and and so I was a little bit concerned: is this going to work? Is this going to disorient me? Um, but I actually, felt in terms of the environment and and being in the suit, it felt very natural to me. It felt like in training, you know, like in the pool, and um, and you know, I could just not worry about the environment and the suit itself, and just uh, really focus on on the task. I was very much task focused. You know, it was my my first and and so far only EVA, and and my focus was really on you know on trying to um, not be a burden, but contribute to the uh, to the spacewalk and and uh, not to do any mistake and obviously be safe. And and so I was very much task focused throughout uh, um, the the entire EVA, and then towards the end, we were called back before we uh, completed the entire initially uh, scheduled timeline. And uh, I, I guess at that point, my uh, lead spacewalker, Alec, uh, he decided to take some time coming back into the airlock, which, uh, um, you know, now looking back, it, it was an amazing opportunity to just, you know, hang out for, for a few minutes out there and, you know, not having anything to do anymore and just uh, enjoy that very special view of, uh, you know, I, I remember just the, the earth uh, flowing beneath me, um, which was on the one hand familiar as, you know, you see it through the window as well, but just not the same because, you know, you have that much broader view and just that awareness that you are actually outside. All right. Looks like we've got time for two more. We'll go now to Gina Sanseri, ABC News. Gina. We've done uh, several stories on whether you sleep better or worse in space. What were your experiences? Better sleep, worse sleep? That's a, uh, so everybody looks at me on this one uh, for some reason. <laughs> no, so I actually had, um, uh, it took me a while to adjust uh, for, uh, to sleep up there. Um, 
you know, I think we, we're just conditioned uh, to certain things down here. One of them is laying down when you sleep, uh, which obviously is not an option uh, up there. Uh, we do have crew quarters. Uh, we have a sleeping bag that we uh, sleep in, and you can kind of cinch yourself down in there. Uh, but it just took me maybe a month or so to adapt uh, to that and really get used to uh, not only the work day and the, you know, the proximity of the work day to the time that you go to sleep, uh, and not really having that wind down time uh, took uh, some adaptation for me. Uh, but once I got it figured out, oh, it was glorious. Uh, one, you don't have the pressure points on you, um, you know, that you might have when you're in the bed or, uh, or anything like that. And then the other uh, is the crew quarters are, uh, you know, pretty quiet. They're very dark. Uh, so it's like having blackout curtains all over the place. Uh, and you can definitely sleep uh, pretty spectacularly. Um, as some of my colleagues may know, uh, but it is uh, it, it, it is really nice. Uh, all that being said, uh, getting back home and when I finally got back to my house and got to lay down in my bed, uh, that was just an absolutely spectacular moment because I did find on orbit that there were times where my body was craving the ability to actually lay down and, and you can't do that because if you get up close to a wall or something like that, you know, that contact instantly makes you start drifting away from it. And it's almost tantalizing because you're like, oh, I just want to lay down. And as you touch it, you start drifting away from it and it's almost frustrating. But um, but yeah, I definitely got my uh, my fair share of uh, solid sleep up there. So that was, uh, that was amazing. All right, and then our last question for the day, David Curley with Discovery Channel, David. Thank you, Dan. Uh, you guys talked about it a little bit today and uh, your pre-departure. Uh, plants, uh, you did a number of experiments uh, with plants. Uh, what's your sense? Do you think it's going to work at scale, growing plants in space? Do you see them as food, environmental uh, control items? And uh, what did it your psyche? You talked a bit about that. Could you expand on that? Anybody that wants to Thank you. Um, I think uh, all, all of the above. I think that, that the ability to grow plants in the space station, that, you know, the test bed that we have right now, with the idea of really maturing that technology and having plants as an integral part of a long duration space flight is, is very important. So plants serve as a psychological benefit. The opportunity to, I, I'm, I'm imagining a module that just has all plants a in it, and to, a greenhouse module that you could go into, tend to the plants, spend time in there. I mean, that would be, I, I think that would be phenomenal here on Earth. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and to, to have that um, capacity in, in a long duration mission would be, would be phenomenal. To go in there, to take care of plants, to be surrounded by something green and growing, um, and to, to, be, to sur be surrounded by that smell of life uh, would, would be amazing. So there's a psychological benefit, as millions of gardeners would testify to. Um, there is an environmental benefit. So plants could help us as a part, an integral part of an a, uh, environmental control and life support system to provide oxygen, to scrub the atmosphere naturally of carbon dioxide and, and to scrub it of other contaminants. So there is a, an equus component. And then um, finally, there's that food component. If we are able to, to garden sustainably using something like the hydroponics or aeroponics that we're investigating with X Roots, um, we have the ability to grow crops. We're growing, as we left, we left behind a tomato plant that had just started to produce little small cherry tomatoes. And it was amazing. It was so much fun to see those growing, to see something recognizable that, uh, that ultimately could be a food source, to add that fresh food to our menu um, you heard how spectacular it was to have fresh fruit come up on a cargo vehicle, to smell an orange, to taste an orange or a grapefruit, and to be able to grow something that we are able to eat as a, as a part of a daily meal um, would be phenomenal. So I think those are three uh, very important um, aspects of, of growing a crop for long duration space flight. And I absolutely think that it's doable. You know, we are at that stage now where we're really trying to identify systems that are scalable. And I think that, that uh, this is a system that would work and we look forward to seeing that mature in a, into, a, in the, into a gardening module. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. it, was a, it was actually pretty spectacular too, because I mean, I am not a green thumb by any stretch. Uh, my wife will attest to that. Um, but 
just having the opportunity to engage with uh, with the, the plants and, and have something up there. I mean, that was the only other living object uh, in space, you know, at that time. And so we're nurturing that thing along and encouraging its growth. Uh, and so to uh, to see all that um, and and know that, you know, we're kind of uh, we're kind of colleagues, you know, with these plants, you know, where, you know, they're helping us and we're helping them. Uh, go along and, and survive here in space was uh, was pretty amazing. So the psychological aspect of it is uh, it can't be understated, uh, I, I don't think. And certainly, you know, the, uh, the sustainability that it provides for uh, long duration missions is uh, is really important. But I'll, I'll just take that back to 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 the Earth, like and how truly magical the Earth is. Mm. You know, to grow these plants required so much intention and forethought and um, and preparation, the, the, the veggie enclosure with this X root system that delivers a certain amount of water that has um, a very specific nutrient mix that require daily observations and, um, and curation to allow these, uh, these plants to grow. And I think we're all familiar, I mean, you drop a seed into the grass, I mean, for those of us that garden and, and pulling weeds out of the garden, you know, things just grow on the earth. And, uh, and it's, it's truly magic that, that a life form is encapsulated in a seed that can fall on the ground and produce um, offspring it is an incredible thing. And it happens by accident here on the earth, where it is in, in space. We have to be so intentional about it, um, so careful about it. And, uh, and it really kind of brings us full circle to look back at the earth and understand mm -hmm. what a, an incredible uh, place it is that, that, uh, that we live upon and, and really uh, reinforces this idea that uh, it is our spaceship. It is all of our spaceship and we need to do a better job to take care of it. Good words. All right. We will end it on that note. Thank you, Chell. Thank you, Wadi. Thank you, Farmer. Thank you, Samantha, for joining us and from Europe. Uh, and thanks, everybody, for tuning in today to, to welcome home and ask some questions of Crew 4. Just wrapped up 170 days in space. Uh, stick around on Twitter. Use the hashtag AskNASA. These three will stick around here and answer a few more of your questions. But with that, we will call it a day. Everyone enjoy the rest of your week, and thanks for tuning in.